I'm Arlene Sifka Radke, a professor of genitourinary medical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, where I do all bladder all the time. And I'm here today with eCancer and my colleague, Dr. Johan Moriot, who's the director of bladder cancer at Gustave Roussy in Paris, France. And we're here today to discuss some of the ASCO abstracts that have presented or been presented in a virtual fashion for those of us who had to attend remotely. So welcome, Johan. Hello, Arin. So I wanted to ask you, you know, with the excitement in bladder cancer at ASCO, what do you, what did you think of the plenary session and, and having a bladder abstract there? Yeah, so it, it was very incredible because I think it's the first time that uh, an abstract was presented during the plenary session and ASCO, so for the bladder cancer. Uh, so it was, uh, I think, a, a very great news for physicians, but also for the patient, because now we can discuss a bladder outside the hospital in the, uh, in the media as well. So I think it's very important first for, for the patients. And obviously, this, uh, uh, this study was very great uh, because uh, we, we have now data supporting that we can change the way we are, we, we are treating patients as first line. So it was a great, great moment. Oh, it certainly was. And for those who haven't yet viewed the abstracts, there was the trial of gemcitabine platinum plus or minus avelumab in the first response or maintenance setting. And in this clinical trial, it took patients who had stable disease or better as response to their first line chemotherapy, and they were randomized to either avelumab or best supportive care. And as Johan has indicated, we saw a significant p-value suggesting giving immunotherapy with avelumab in that frontline maintenance setting was associated with an improvement in survival from 14 to 21 months. But well, avalumab has now entered the ranks of one other checkpoint inhibitor for bladder cancer, pembrolizumab, which also showed a significant p-value in a large randomized trial. What do you think about the options of giving immunotherapy? Is it better to give it in the maintenance setting, or is it better to give it second line at progression? So it's, um, it's uh, I think, the most relevant question we can have from this uh the study, Javelin study. Um, I think it's, uh, it's still a case by case discussion we should have. For example, a patient to achieve a complete response after a four to six cycle of chemotherapy maybe want to have a break because it's fed up with the uh, side effect of the chemotherapy. And I think for this patient, it's fine to give a break and maybe to give subsequent immunotherapy like pembrolizumab as second line, but for a patient to achieve only stable disease with bone meds, liver meds, I would prefer to give maintenance immunotherapy with avelumab in this patient. So overall, we have level one evidence with avelumab, but still we have to maybe to discuss case by case with the patient, which strategy is the better for the patient. That's a really good point, because as Johan mentioned, patients who have the high disease burden, we do know from the pembrolizumab data, they did not do as well, especially in the setting of liver metastases. So it does seem that there's a cohort of patients who would benefit from receiving immunotherapy right away before their disease is explosive. But we also have to consider there's risk as well, both the risk of toxicity if patients do not yet require treatment or possibly the cost to their pocketbook, you know, going on treatment that maybe would not benefit them. So I think it is a very exciting time. And I think seeing another agent show a significant p-value impacting survival really tells us that immunotherapy is here to stay for the treatment of urothelial cancer. 
I know there's several other abstracts of novel agents that have shown, you know, a, a lot of interest and uh, especially the work with Erdafitnib. And I, I know that you're a definite collaborator um, on this trial as well, Johan. Yeah, the, um, the, there is a, a, a huge interest in, uh, in target therapy in bladder cancer. And of course, the FJ4 inhibitors are uh, maybe the top leader in the field of target therapy in bladder cancer. So you are lucky in the US because you have access to Erdafitnib in second line. It's not the case uh, in Europe because we have to wait uh, for the phase three trial, which enrolls still patients. But uh, we have data here at ASCO trying to, uh, to combine uh, FGFR inhibitors with immunotherapies. That's something we are we, we, we are willing to uh, to uh, to look at, and there is uh, many phase one and phase two uh, trial like the North uh, combining uh, the fit name with the trivimab and Alasco. We, we we got some data from uh, a different LGFR inhibitor, regoratinib, combined with atuzumab as well. That's a really good point. We're, we're seeing FGF inhibitors working well in bladder cancer. The long-term follow-up data from the erdafitinib trial suggests that there's a median overall survival of around 11 months with a median two years of follow-up and still seeing that 40% objective response rate uh, that was confirmed on a second study. And building on that backbone of FGF-targeted therapy, we saw other combinations being presented, specifically the erdafitinib with citrilimab combination, which is showing response rates of around 50% in the phase one portion, and other FGF inhibitors as well, such as rogaratinib plus immunotherapy, which was showing an objective response rate around 60% in the small phase one portion of the trial. So we have several FGF combinations that are coming into play. And uh, I know the rogaratinib strategy was still looking at mRNA or amplification. Uh, what do you think about that strategy in general, Johan? It's still unclear if an amplification or an expression, overexpression of FGFR3 is a very good target in bladder cancer. Is we, we don't have very, very strong data to support that. We are sure that fusion and mutation are oncogenic, but for the overexpression, we are not sure. So the strategy used in this trial can broaden the, the, the number of patients that could be treated with an FGFR inhibitors, but, but maybe the response rate could be lower but because once again, an amplification or an overexpression is not as oncogenic, has a mutation or, or a fusion. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good point as well. Uh, we, when we saw the randomized data from single agent rogaratinib, the response rate looking at amplification was lower, around 20% compared to the response rate we saw with erdafitinib, which focused more on those FGFR3 mutations and fusions. There's other targeted agents as well, such as infigratinib, and we saw some data presented at ASCO as well, suggesting a response rate maybe as high as 40%, but a median survival of seven months. Do you think that accounts for any differences in the drug or differences in trial, Johan? I think it's, uh, there is a different reason. The specificity of the, of the uh, inhibitor could be different between infigratinib and erdafitinib, for example. And the, uh, maybe the trial and the way that we uh, personalize the, uh, the dose with erdafitinib because it be shown that the phosphate level was, was correlated with the uh, the response. So that's something that could explain the difference in terms of response.
So that's a that's definitely a good point. Achieving the relevant dose could play an impact on response. And when you also look at the two drugs, the infogratinib is given on an intermittent schedule, three weeks out of four, compared to ertafitinib, which is given on a continuous schedule. So I, I don't think we can declare any definitive evidence that one is definitely better than the other without a randomized trial design. And I think it will take more time to see how many of the other FGF inhibitors pan out as single agents. But with the combination strategies with immunotherapy, the hope is that we will you know, soon have these options that provide more long-term durable benefit. Because while ertafitinib and other FGF inhibitors work, they are like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and the benefit does appear to be more limited to time while you are on treatment rather than durable responses off therapy, or at least that's been my impression. Is, is that yours as well, Johan? Yeah, I think the, the, uh, the most important end point with when we combine FGFR inhibitors with the uh, immunotherapy, the durability of the response and if we look at the melanoma field, uh, when you combine target therapy and immunotherapy, you can increase the uh, response rate, but the feeling is that uh, maybe the durability is, is longer. So that's something we, we, we want to show in, in bladder cancer as well. Yeah, that's uh, definitely going to be more important as the field develops, showing that durability of response, which we've seen with immunotherapy options, creating durability even in patients off treatment. So building to those better combinations or building on that backbone of immune checkpoint inhibition seems like a very reasonable strategy to help enhance the field. What do you think about other combination strategies that are being developed in urothelial cancer? So there, there is many uh, different uh, combinations uh, ongoing. One uh, reported uh, at this ASCO was to combine cabozantinib uh, with immunotherapy, so atezolizumab. There is a rationale to do that because we know that angiogenesis is one of the mechanisms of resistance to uh, immunotherapy, and we have good example from the renal cancer when we combine uh, angiogenesis inhibitors and immunotherapy, you can expect a very good outcome. So there was a, a phase one trial combining cabozantinib and uh, atezolizumab, and I think the uh, data are quite encouraging. Uh, in, uh, in this uh, data, we had patient previously treated with uh, chemotherapy and uh, the response rate right around 25%. So it's quite good, but we need now to, uh, to provide more data to know if the combination is an excellent combination. So it sounds like combinations of immunotherapy, either sequenced with chemotherapy or possibly combined with chemotherapy, combining immunotherapy with other targeted agents like FGF inhibitors. Now we're seeing a rationale for combinations with MET and VEGF inhibitors with the cabozatinib data. So it really does appear that we're using immunotherapy as that backbone and trying to build upon the immune response to enhance the long-term benefit for our patients. So I'd like to take this time to thank you, Johan, for your insights and the treatment of your ethelial cancer. I'd like to thank all of our listeners who are listening today, and I hope that everyone's remaining appropriately socially distant during these coronavirus times as we work toward getting back together and continuing to find better treatments for your ethelial cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene.